Like, don't get me wrong. I love using flexies. What's up, guys? You were close, Marianne. What's up, Clayton? Hope everybody has a good Monday. Now just pop up. I want to do it early. My wife and boy get back tomorrow. So my bachelor party's over. And I never thought I would be saying these words, but I don't want to miss the uh, Iowa LSU women's basketball game tonight. Again, I never thought I would say those words, but I'm excited about it. I really enjoy watching Caitlin Clark play, and I was praying for a rematch of last year's game, so I hope it's a good one. Hope it's a good one. What's up, Bridget? Mm -hmm. Hey, Michelle. It is Monday, right? Yeah, Monday. Yeah, and of course, they're flying back in tomorrow from New York, and we got really dangerous weather coming in here for tomorrow, so do you watch women's? No, I don't watch any hockey. Patty, I don't like hockey. I love it live. It's the best sport I've ever seen live, except for boxing. Hey, D, but um, not a hockey guy. Not a hockey guy. But college, women's college basketball. What's up, Nick? Your dog's looking good, Nick. Hello, Miss White. Norway. Hello, Newt. Did I say that right, Newt? Canute? Newt? Mm, yeah, that's right. You're in Canada, right? That's a religion. That is a religion. I just give people, hey, John, how you doing, buddy? I just, uh, I'm pretty excited because I, I got myself, I scored three hog, pints of haagen for like $2.49 a piece. I already knocked one out of the box. That's all I'm eating tonight. Get ready for the games. Mm -hmm. Oh, not here. It's warm. Ah, good deal, Nick. Good deal. What is these things popping up on my computer? What are these things? There's no bourbon tonight. So. George. Oh, oh, I didn't see the, I didn't get to see the whole thing. Denise, I had to, um, what did I do? Oh, I stopped to eat in Nashville, I found a new dumpling place. So I missed a good part, like majority of it. I saw like the first 20 minutes. So I'll go back and catch it. Yeah, George is a good dude. Good dude. A lot of wisdom there, you know. Speaking of wisdom, I don't know if I should follow up on that. But let's get into it. We won't stay on too long tonight. Where do I even start? That was the first time around in tear dogs and distraction of business. Yeah, you do, you 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 do real well with that stuff, Nick. He looks he looks really good. Um, all right, guys. <clears throat> I don't want to beat a dead horse, right? I don't want to be one of those people that gets on here and and says all the same shit all the time. We, we have that. It's, the podcasts, everything. There's so much out there. It's always the same stuff. And we we tend to focus on so much to the negative stuff. And we don't talk about a lot of the good things. Um, 
and I get to work with so many amazing people. What's up, Derek? Like really phenomenal people. And today it just made my day. I had to go down. If you guys remember Keela, the German shepherd I did a board and train with, I had to go down and do a private session today with them. And this is like, I think the fifth time we've met, right? So let's talk about reality. First of all, hey, Brad, let's talk about reality. I know there's a lot of trainers that don't like when I talk about board and trains are useless without enough private lessons and education. I, I know people, there's a lot of people that don't like that because they don't do that. But I'm always going to be honest, whether I offend some of my friends and people I like or not, I'm, I, I, I can only be honest about that stuff. Okay. You take a dog like Keela, like probably the best female, not probably, she is the best female German Shepherd I ever worked with, right? She's amazing, but she's a lot of dog. Bat shit crazy. Well, she did great with me. She's supposed to, right? But when you put a dog like that back in the home, we're just starting training. So again, today's like the fifth time, right? Like the fifth time, five private lessons. And there's going to be more because transferring information and teaching clients is one thing. It takes time, you know, hey, Shannon, it takes time. It's very hard to change human habits. And the one thing that I've learned over the years is you have to give people a little at a time, allow them to comprehend and then move on. But when you take a dog like Keela, who really is a lot, something like going batshit crazy with the doorbell can be really difficult at times, right? Here with me, no problem. At home, all those habits have been established. And then you're dealing with um, different family members handling her because like her, her owner is a real cool young guy. He's real active. He does a lot of things, but he also works a lot. So he's fortunate enough that his mom takes care of her a lot. But again, Keel is a lot. So it's almost like every time we conquer something with one person, like she'll go right back to what she was doing before. So today, like, and this is the second time in a row, literally, we didn't leave the living room. We were going to just fix the doorbell stuff, right? So I spent the first hour talking and explaining things and going deep in the things and picking the little things out inside the home that she gave us opportunities to talk about or picking the little things out that that you know the owners would do that like really little things that people don't think about that matter that matter right anyone who knows me knows i talk about that relationship between you and the dog and how it's developed inside the home. For me, it's everything, right? If you conquer that, that's where the behavior is created, good or bad, with you inside the home, where you spend the majority of your time, right? What you develop between you and that dog. So to get off that subject real quick, right? By the time I left, it was, it was wonderful. Like literally, huh, did we have to do anything? Shit, I don't think... I think by the time we got to the actual doorbell, she was just real chill with everything. So it was amazing. It was great, right? And we set her up in many different situations, but it went real well. That lesson had nothing to do with Keela and the doorbell. Nothing to do with that. That's just a little sidebar of the interaction where I'm trying to explain how valuable and vital and important that relationship is between the dog and the human, right? can't stress it enough. Like it's irreplaceable. And what does that mean to a lot of people, right? You can't just talk about what well, you got. Everyone says you got to have a relationship. Well, what does that mean? Most people don't know what that means. So we have to kind of dig a little deeper into that and give many different examples and scenarios, right? What do we see in today's world and dog world? A lot of people get the wrong dog, the wrong breed, too much dog, right? Too much dog for so many, so many people do that. And then they give too much freedom right from the start. And the dog develops bad habits. And we spend most of the time fixing the things we don't like instead of creating, you know, paying more attention to the dog we do get as a puppy. 
really restricting that dog's access to get into trouble, right? Guiding it the way we want it to behave and managing its freedom and giving it freedom in little doses as it can handle it. So for me, I'm psychotic with it. And those first two years, two years are based on raising the best dog I can raise. And I don't say many good things about myself when it comes to dog training, but that's something I'm really good at, really good at. I know how to raise a well, well-rounded, well-behaved dog. So I've never had a dog that I can't take anyone in the real world and have it off leash with no tools. And it's going to do what I ask it to do. Why? Because it wants to be with me. Right. So ask yourself this and be honest about it. If you take your dog to out to the woods to go hiking or something where there's people, right? Let's say you take your dog down to Percy Warner Park in Nashville, beautiful area to go hiking. A lot of people, a lot of dogs. You take off the leash, all collars and everything, and let the dog loose and just go for a hike. What will your dog do? If your dog stays with you, right? And I don't mean glued to your side. I mean, like, is out there enjoying the day, the hike, the outdoors with you. And if you turn around, hey, Chrissy, and go the other way, does it see you and go with you? Or does it just take off and start chasing dogs and people, right? Ask yourself that. If you can't put your dog in that situation, that's not a training issue. That's a relationship issue, okay? It's not a training issue. We focus more on training today than ever before. And we have more problems than ever before, okay? So the first 10, 12 years of me training dogs I didn't use food. I didn't use e-collars. I didn't use prong collars. I didn't use anything. My dogs were trained by learning how to live with us inside the home and by walking and exploring every day with the leash and a flat collar. That's why to me, walking is so valuable. You're exploring and moving forward and dogs love that. That's how I trained my dogs. And I had really good dogs. Now, don't get me wrong. I completely screwed up my first couple of dogs, okay? Like my first dog that me and Stephanie got together, the, th the dog that got me into this, we destroyed. We made a mental weakling because of the things that we did because we were selfish. We didn't have children. That was our child. And that's how we treated that puppy. And we raised a dog that was never, ever confident in the real world. We did that, not the dog. I did that. You understand? Our second dog was a Rottweiler, our first Rottweiler. I did a little better with that dog, but I had the local veterinarians out in Arizona tell me, do not take this puppy out of your house for the first year because Parvo is really bad down here. Well, hey, vets know what they're talking about, right? So I'm going to believe them. So for a whole year, that dog never left the house. Never left the yard. It looks like I'm getting stuck here or something, right? So guess what happens the first time I take him out? First time I take him out, I call my buddy John, who has a boxer, a young boxer about his age. I say, John, you want to get the dogs together today? He goes, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay. Start walking. I'll meet you halfway down. We'll let the dogs meet. All right, great. Now, my buddy John is a black dude. My dog's never seen a black person. The brownest person he's ever seen is my wife, right? I had people over the house, maybe. I used to have a lot of friends back then. But he's never been exposed to different races of people for the most part. Never got to see anything. He's never met another dog except our dog. And now I'm taking him, and we're walking down the street facing each other as we're coming. And my dog's looking like, what the hell is this? I don't know this dog thing, right? So we get close together and my Rottweiler is not barking, not growling, not going crazy, but you can see the confusion in him. He doesn't know what to do. He's just on edge. And then my buddy's boxer takes his paw and he hits my Rottweiler in the head. That's all my Rottweiler needed. Oh, you want some of this? He grabbed that dog and flipped him over and pinned him down. And I was like, holy shit. So we're trying to get them apart, but their collars got tangled and they were stuck. 
So I'm yelling at my buddy, John, John, grab your dog. We got to get them apart. He goes, man, I ain't touching those fucking dogs. I said, dude, you got to help me. So I eventually got him apart and my dog didn't hurt him. He just didn't know how to act. And he didn't like being hit in the head by this goofy boxer, right? That was me because I listened to a veterinarian who knows nothing about dog behavior and dog training, but I trusted them because they're a vet. They know this stuff, right? No, they don't. And today, how many vets give bad advice to everyday dog owners, right? I've been there. That was horrible advice. The good thing about me is I always learn from my mistakes. I never make the same mistakes twice. So I took that and I became obsessed with learning on the behavior side of things. So again, for a long time, I didn't use food. I barely taught obedience. Like I didn't you think about it, obedience, down, sit, heel, come, all that stuff's tricks. It's human tricks, right? I was obsessed with the behavior. And the first trainer that I worked under, that I worked with, he had the best behaved dogs I had ever seen. And that's all I wanted. And that's who I focused on, watched him, how he trained, what he did. You know, the first time I took my our first dog, who was, um, who was uh, Ben, Ben was our first dog. I remember, remember the little red pickup truck that I sold recently or gave away recently? I had that in Arizona, right? Like 27 years ago. And we were going to our first class with him and I put him in the back of the pickup truck because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Especially when you're out in the West, Southwest, you have a pickup truck, you put your dog in the back. He was five months old and we leave the house and we start driving to go train and he jumped out of the back of the truck. Good thing we were just in our neighborhood and he didn't really get hurt, but he jumped out of the back of the truck. I was like, holy shit. I never put a dog in the back of the truck again, right? I just assumed it would be common sense for the dog to stay back there. No, it's not. Well, we started training in this group with this trainer and a bunch of people, and our dog was by far the worst. It was embarrassing. And me and Stephanie used to laugh. He was terrible. He was terrible. He was a lab border collie mix. Eventually, I found out that he was crazy about a Frisbee and he was awesome with the Frisbee and that became our life. That's what I did to fulfill him. You know, we played Frisbee a lot and he was a great dog, a sweet dog. Wouldn't harm a fly, right? Like that cat, that dog had gotten his ass kicked from a, a cat at a vet's office before. He was like just totally harmless. He never wanted to fight no one. But one day, me and him go for a walk. It's just me and him before we even got the Rottweiler and there was, it looked like, you know, it looked like, like a Caucasian Ocharka on the other side of the, our neighborhood, the two of them. Right. And every day we would pass and these two dogs would go crazy behind the fence and it was scary shit. Well, one day me and little Ben are walking and these dogs go crazy and they blow through the fence. I nearly shit my pants. They blow through the fence and they start coming and no bullshit. My little weak ass Ben, my mentally weak dog, gets out in front of me and starts barking and going crazy. And those dogs just stopped and looked at us. Like as soon as they were out of their yard, they had no issues anymore. You understand? And I was like, good job, Ben. Way to go, buddy. And we got the hell out of there. And I swear to you, that dog looked at me like, did I just do that? I was like, fuck yeah, you did that. You're the baddest motherfucker I've ever seen. And this dog was, he used to get visibly excited like I did amazing. It was incredible, right? But we destroyed our dogs. Me and Stephanie did that. We had good intentions. The problem is that was 27, 28 years ago. Today, that's what everybody still does. And no one is helping them, right? No one's helping them because now we have all kinds of new systems and programs and special things and tools to do this, tools to do that. And we're failing. We're failing miserably. And the reason I say this, I did an online consultation today with a gentleman out of Portugal. He sent me his videos that I request yesterday. And when I watched his videos, I was like, why is this guy calling me? Like, this is really good stuff. He's doing fantastic, you know, not just because the obedience was great, because this dog was having the time of its life with him and it was beautiful. So today we did our call. Really, really cool guy. And we're talking and he says something about it. I said, wait a second. How old did you say your dog is? It's three and a half months old. It's a baby. But it's big because it's a, it's a Portuguese flock guarding dog, a very serious dog, not a dog that's easy to train. 
And I'm like, whoa, dude, like, you're, are you kidding me? Like, you are killing it. You know, you are killing it. And he had some very specific questions that he wanted answered to make sure he was doing things right by how he was raising the dog. It was such a breath of fresh air, like such a breath of fresh air. This man was amazing. We only made it 30 minutes into our hour call. And I said, here, send me more videos. Send me this. I'm just going to keep working with you, right? Because this is great. Like you have so much potential. You're going to have an amazing dog. And he was doing everything fantastic. There was a few things he was doing that he wanted to question. Am I doing this right? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you're doing absolutely brilliant. You understand? Like doing absolutely brilliant. If you look at back at uh, Jim drove down from Canada um, this past summer, two dogs. He drove down from Canada to have private lessons here. I begged him not to. Like I always beg people, please don't drive that far to come see me. It's not worth it. I know good trainers all over the country, but he insisted. So he comes down. He's got two dogs, a Belgian Malinois and a Belgian Malinois Husky mix. Both dogs, he got off Craigslist. Did everything wrong to get his dogs, right? Got the first dog when he was in, in, a, in, a, in a rough place, right? Got the dog to kind of have something to do and pull him out and gets a Belgian Mallow off Craigslist. Doesn't get no worse, right? Same thing with the other dog. These dogs were amazing. Amazing. It's one of the best Malinois I've seen in a really long time. Big, strong, beautiful, powerful, drivey, social, friendly, outgoing. The perfect Belgian Malinois. His Husky Malinois mix. Same thing. We're working with the Malinois. He's exploring the park on his own. Doesn't have to worry about him. Because if he calls him, come here, Blue. He's just going to come back. Right? So eventually I asked him, I said, Jim, what did you do? Because you have amazing dogs. Like you've done phenomenal. He said, I just listened to you. I walked my dogs and I played with them. I walked a lot. I did a lot of walking and traveling and I played with them. That's all I did. And I was like, fuck, think about that. I just did what you said, what you told me to do, what you tell people to do. I walked my dogs and I played with them. These dogs were crazy about him. He has the relationship that everyone should have. He didn't get it by shoving food in their face. He didn't get it by using an e-collar for everything or a prong collar, right? Or barking orders at them. He just spent time with his dogs and explored, explored. And he found out how they liked to play and he played with them. Like, Think about that. This isn't a dog trainer. This is a guy who was in the business world that got his first dog. It was like, oh, it's pretty cool. You know, let me get another one. He spent time with his dogs. That's all he did and created two unbelievable dogs. Someone sent me a video the other day, right? I don't watch a lot of dog trainers videos unless it's something that I'm working on and learn like a lot of the sport dog people. I, I, every day I consume so much stuff. I don't watch a lot of pet dog stuff and I don't care what people are doing. Like I'm not someone who's going to go on and start naming names and talking. I, I don't do that shit. So I always talk in general, right? Today I made a post about on Facebook, how, how many people have ever asked for a refund for, from a dog trainer that didn't do what they said. And someone on there said, why are we talking about dog trainers? That's not talking about dog trainers. That's talking about what's white, what's right, and what's wrong. That's a problem that you think we're talking about dog trainers, right? Because if you take your car to a mechanic and they don't fix it, you're not paying. But for some reason, the majority of people who pay a fortune for dog training get zero results. Many times the dog comes back worse and they never get a refund. That's why I'm talking about it because the dogs can't. You understand? They can't. So is it my job to try to make the industry better? No, no, but I can't keep my fucking mouth shut. I try. 
I try. I'd be so much happier if I just ignored everything that went on and worried about myself. And I have tried that. I'm not fucking good at it because when I see wrong to the animals, wrong to the people, it bothers the fuck out of me because I have a lot of flaws, a lot of flaws, man. I've done things in my life that none of you would believe. If most of you knew, you wouldn't run your mouth about me. Believe me when I tell you. But I'm honest. I don't fucking lie. I don't lie. I treat the people right that I work with, and I treat the animals right. Someone sent me a video the other day, said, please watch the whole thing. It's long, but I want your take on it. That's a dog trainer, fairly popular. And it was embarrassing. And I'm thinking... I don't think this person's a bad person. I really don't. And I do think he thinks they're doing really good stuff. That's why he's showing it. And it's absolutely horrendous. Horrendous. Awful, awful work. With multiple dogs fighting in the same home. You know what everything came down to? Multiple e-collars. Correct everything with an e-collar. Everything with an e-collar. You go for a walk. If the dog starts pulling, we're going to correct it with the e-collar. Your dog looks at the other dog. It's an e Everything was the e-collar. You, know you know what percentage chance for those dogs to succeed, that owner to succeed is? It's zero. Zero percent chance of success in that household. Zero. Like that. that's not even a question. Zero percent chance. I work with a lot of people that have dogs fighting in the same home. It's not easy. It is not easy. And this month alone, I've told several people, you're not going to do this. People that I've tried with, like I said, first, I'm going to give it a go with you. and I'm going to help you. But I need to see where we progress. And once I get to see how much the people can grasp and understand and see and how, how like committed to not making mistakes they are. I'm very honest. And I say it's, you can keep both of these dogs or all three of these dogs, right? It's going to be constant management. Management fails a hundred percent of the time. And not one of your dogs will ever live the fulfilled, happy life because you insist on keeping them all. And eventually something bad's going to happen. Or you can find the other one, a really good home where it could thrive. And then the dog you keep can thrive and you only keep one dog. But you have people that want to get a powerful breed. It doesn't even have to be a powerful breed, but for some reason it always is. And they don't have the ability to deal with that one dog. And they add another dog to the picture thinking that it's going to keep their other dog busy doesn't work that way, people. You're just amplifying your problems. So I sat through this whole video and the amount of talking that went on, it's a big mistake that dog trainers make. Talking, 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 talking to the client nonstop. They're retaining nothing. They're retaining nothing. I promise you, they're retaining fucking nothing. I swear to you. You're wasting your breath and you just like to hear yourself talk. Put the people to work. Let them work in front of you with the dogs. Let them make the mistakes. Show them where the mistakes are and let them make the fucking mistakes over and over and over until they get it right. Because then when they finally get it right, now they know it. That's one thing. Now you can move on to the next very simple thing. And you pile up on that. You pile up on that. Okay? But it's fucking insanity what we're doing here. Like, it, it's, it's insanity. The online stuff I'm doing and the private lessons I'm doing, it's been the best education ever for me. It really has. I've learned more from that in the past few years than any the seminars, the people you meet, because you see what's really out there and where people struggle. Right. I told you I've never I've said this before. I've never once said out loud or thought in my head that I'm a really good dog trainer. I've never thought that or said that. 
until a couple of years ago, I was visiting a dog trainer, very well respected dog trainer, right? Very well respected. I always liked them, always respected them. I would send people to them in a heartbeat. And after 30 minutes of being with them, I was appalled at what I saw. I was appalled. I couldn't believe what I had just witnessed. And this is in front of me. I left that home. I got in my car and I called my wife. And for the very first time, I said to my wife, I'm a really good dog trainer, really good dog trainer. Because if someone would ask me, hey, who's better, you or this person? I'd probably say, ah. I don't know. I, I, I'd probably give it to them because I, I don't I can't judge myself. You know what I mean? That, that feels kind of weird. No comparison, like not even in the same stratosphere. That's the first time I ever said that and actually believed it like no bullshit. You understand? So that's why I'm consumed with learning. But I learn more from the people that are struggling and I see what they've been through. I, I have clients that have spent over twenty thousand dollars in dog training. Some of the biggest names in the business, social media stars. Right. And that's why that's always on the pet dog side of things. You understand? And some of these people I like, they're good people. Like personally, I like them. But I wouldn't refer people to them for dog training because they're not good. They're huge stars. They have huge followings, much bigger than me. But they're not good dog trainers. And I don't say that to be an asshole or nothing. It's just honesty, right? So I'm working with a mutt right now that this wonderful person's driving from good distance away and has already spent thousands, thousands, real big name dog trainers, no relief in her dog's aggression on leash. You know how long we worked for that? The very first lesson was all about her. I just worked on her. She knew nothing. No dog trainer taught her anything. There was no handling skills there. Not her fault. Wonderful lady. Wonderful lady. I like her so much, but no one taught her anything. I have to teach her first. I have to teach her, right? And she's going to struggle, but that's okay. Because by the time we get to that third, fourth time together, it's going to start clicking. The second time we met, now I brought a dog out for the first time. I only did it that quick. Because I knew this dog wasn't going to be difficult. And yes, he blew up when I started approaching with my dog. And she struggled with him. So I put my dog in a down. I went over there and I showed her how we're going to stop this right now. And it's not difficult. And I didn't have to be an asshole. And I didn't have to be harsh. And there was no e-collars involved. Right? Then I went back and got the dog and we did all this stuff and he didn't care. He was totally cool. And now he started checking in with her instead of going after the dog. He also wouldn't play until I sat on the ground and he's scared of strangers. So he was timid of me and I didn't force it on him. I just sat on the ground and I played a little bit. I played just a little, made him curious. And then when he finally came over to check things out, I just kind of covered up and pushed him in the ass like, hey, get away from me. And he was like, what? I'm coming back at you. No, get away from me. And before you know it, the ass is going and we're playing. Beautiful things to see. But what the fuck did this poor woman just pay thousands of dollars for? She got nothing. That's me. I have to offer the money back. She's not going to get offered that money back. Right? You're going to just see them producing all kinds of fancy shit every day. Again, watch some of these trainers that have huge channels, much bigger than me, and see how much training you actually see. See how much training opposed to how much talking, doing nothing, standing around. Great. Some of them, great personalities in front of the camera, right? One in particular I'm thinking of, I don't like, don't like, but he's got great personality in front of the camera, huge channel, but there's videos that come out every day, has someone following around with the camera, filming everything. And he's going to talk about a subject that's trending. So he keeps growing his channel. So as long as he keeps posting videos, and follows things that are trending, they're going to get massive amount of views. Go look at my YouTube channel. I have between 14 and 15 million views. That might seem like a lot to most. 142,000 subscribers, that's not a lot. To the average person, it is. But my channel doesn't grow because I don't post consistently or a lot. 
And I only post what I feel like posting. I don't care what's trending. You understand what I'm saying? My channel grew because in 2009 or 2010, I was putting out a lot of videos trying to help the everyday dog owner. Not with bullshit, just trying to show things that help the everyday dog owner. That's always been my focus. How could I help the everyday dog owner? So as a whole, purely positive people, balanced trainers on the pet dog side, sport dog people, everybody, everyone talks about the same thing, making the dog training world better for the dogs, right? Stopping tool bands, breed bands. Well, how many people actually focus more on that cause and have and helping the everyday dog owner instead of your marketing campaigns to sell the shit you're selling? Nothing wrong with doing that. Everyone has a right to make a living, right? But take how much you're focused on your marketing program and selling shit as opposed to how much you're trying to actually help the everyday dog owner. The everyday dog owner. Think about that. I want you to really think how many people come to mind, right? How many people actually show the work, right? Actual dog training work. Think about it. When I was a little kid, the first dog I was really attached to was my grandparents' dog, German Shepherd King. They always said my family had German Shepherds. I didn't have a dog growing up. My family had dogs. We lived in a raunchy apartment in, in Lodi, New Jersey. Couldn't have a dog. We had mice. I never trained a mouse. My grandparents' dog, King, I was very close with. I loved that dog to death. He was always with the family, right? I don't even know if he had a collar. There was no place boards. Place wasn't a command. There was no obedience. I never saw my grandparents ask him to sit or down or do anything. Me and my grandma would go for a walk with him. He had no leash on. And we're in a busy area, Little Ferry, New Jersey, right? Right outside of Manhattan. And we'd go for a walk. She never said anything to the dog. He just would be with us. One day we're walking and across the street, this dog that looked like Benji, like a sheepdog kind of thing, comes bursting out of his front door and he attacks my grandma's German Shepherd and King kicks that dog's ass real fast. And then the dog runs off crying and screaming. And we just went back to walk in. My grandmother never flinched. She wasn't a dog trainer at all. And I remember asking, like, why did that dog do that, grandma? And I don't remember the exact answer. It was just something like, I just wasn't a very nice dog. <laughs> but we didn't flinch. You know what I mean? My uncle Mike, her brother, lived in Delaware. And he lived on a big piece of property, four acres out in the country. To us, that was a huge piece of property back then. And I'd spend a few weeks out with him. And he had this German shepherd named Duke. And Duke hated me. Duke hated my guts because him and my uncle were inseparable. They were sidekicks. And when I came, if we drove into town, Duke had to get in the back of the truck. And man, that dog used to get pissed, right? I've never seen a leash or a collar on that dog. We'd go into town. That dog would sit in the back of the truck. He'd go every place with us. We never had to worry about anything, right? Never. One time in the winter, two, two guys hit my uncle's truck with a snowball. He opened the front door. Go get him, Duke. Duke went down, nailed him, came back. There was no formal training there. But you know what the difference was? They had a beautiful relationship. There was respect on both ends there, right? They enjoyed each other's company. They were a team. My uncle was the captain of that team. Make no mistake about it, but they were a team. My grandmother was the captain of that team, but they were a team. Same thing with my dogs. My dogs aren't perfect, but they're awesome. They're awesome. We are a team. If I go out and throw Dante in the truck and we go someplace new to train, there's no collars on. There's no e-collar on him, right? I'm not working on the send out with an e-collar or anything. Like there's no collar on him. I don't have to work. He doesn't want to go anyplace else because he's fucking crazy about me. Like he's my buddy. He's my buddy. Same thing with Luca. Same thing with Mango. Bruno used to travel the country with me. Like, you couldn't ask for a better dog. Why was he so popular? Well, when you see a Rottweiler, a big, scary breed, right, that's so loving and social with everyone, you could put him in any situation. That's what built my business. 
because when people saw me with him, you train dogs. Yeah, I train. I, this is your dog. Yeah. Give me a card. Sold. I already sold them to hire me as their trainer because of what I had with me. I was able to show the work. Oh, your two-year-old child is scared of dogs. Can I have Bruno go say hi to him? Or do you want to come say hi to Bruno? Are you sure he's okay? I promise you, I wouldn't do that, right? No bullshit. Go say hi, Bruno. He'd go up so nice and gentle. I've never seen a child scared of dogs not completely turn around with Bruno. Why was he like that? He was the worst puppy we ever had. The worst puppy we ever had. He was one of 13. The other 12 were all put down. He was, I think, seven months old when Sophia was born. And at about nine months old, Bruno was about nine months old. Sophia was a baby. I got called away for work for six months. I had to leave. Six months. And I said, Steph, we can't keep this dog. I can't leave this dog with you. We had the other dog too. And she's like, we can't get rid of him. Like, we've never gotten rid of a dog. That doesn't even come to my head. But I was like, Stephanie, I can't leave you with this dog for six months and a new baby. She said, I'll, I'll take care of it. Every day, my badass wife put Sophia in a jogging stroller. She put Bruno on one side with a backpack on, five pounds of rice on each side, the other dog on the other side, and would run for 45 minutes a day just to give him something to do. A carry this weight, run with me. I'm pretty sure that's part of the reason why him and Sophia were so bonded. Why? You have this little thing just out in front of him and he's at her side following her. The love affair between those two was gorgeous. It was beautiful. But guess what? All the little girls in the neighborhood would come knock on my door and say, can we take Bruno for a walk? Yeah, go ahead. We'll go. You think any parent ever had an issue with that? No, because I exposed him to everyone from day one as a puppy. As a puppy, he met everyone in the neighborhood because I never wanted people to fear him. Because if you have a Rottweiler or a pit bull, you have a different responsibility. So from day one, when I brought him home as a puppy, he met everyone. So everyone loved him from day one and he loved everyone. You understand? That's how it was. When our, our Rottweiler before him, Cyrus, we were at a park by our first apartment where we lived. Big county park behind us. We go in an empty baseball field at night. Me, Stephanie, our dog Ben, and Cyrus. There's a ball game going on in the next field. Not that close to us, but next field. I could see Cyrus looking for a way out. And I'm like, don't do it, dude. Cyrus finds a way out to the main gate, squeezes out, and I hear people screaming. That dude, Cyrus, ran out onto the ball field and was chasing the ball. And parents are screaming. If it wasn't for two little kids that lived in our neighborhood, they started screaming, he's friendly, we know him. And they grabbed Cyrus and were hugging on him. Man, I didn't want to run because I didn't want people to think I was panicked. So I kind of just walked out there. The looks from parents, they wanted to kill me. And I can't blame them. I can't blame them, right? But that dog was like, there's people there and I just want to play. Like, I love these kids, right? And he used to play ball with kids. So he was like, fuck it. Like, this is great, Dad, but I got to go play. <laughs> it was great. But everything we've done has been based off relationships. That, that, that's it. I didn't start teaching things till later on. I didn't even like it. I didn't enjoy it. I did it to make myself a better trainer. And eventually you have to do that stuff, right? But you guys that go on to YouTube and watch dog training videos and listen to what people say, really look deeply at what you're getting into, what you're looking at, okay? Because we have more dog trainers than ever. There, that's not an argument. No one's going to dispute that. And we have more dog problems than ever. Why is that? We have terrible breeding. We <laughs> spay and neuter our dogs as puppies and adolescents. We give fucking every vaccine under the sun. We feed shitty, shitty food. You name it, we do it. Right. The first time I started talking about not spaying and neutering, whoo, people went crazy, crazy. Right. The shelters are overflowing. Yeah, it's not helping. Spaying and neutering doesn't empty your shelters. 
and keeping your dogs intact won't make them more full, right? All you're doing is letting irresponsible assholes getting away with being irresponsible assholes it has nothing to do with spaying and neutering. That's it. That's it. You know, I, I don't, I don't understand. All my dogs are intact. As a matter of fact, mango just went into heat today. Buddy and Luca will go outside and they'll still play together. They won't fight. Dante will not fight with them. There will be no dog fights. I won't let them wrestle with her because they want to wrestle with her. But she'll be out there with them. Socially, they're all together. Physically, they'll be separated, right? For her. But the, the males, they'll go out and play. They won't eat for three days when she's in prime breeding. But I give my dogs vaccines their first year, and then we're done. Then we're done. Why? Well, my first Rottweiler died of bone cancer at six years old. That didn't make sense to me. I did everything right. I neutered him when he was four months old. You told me that was healthy. I couldn't understand why he grew so tall. How come his head never developed? Why do you look like half Doberman? Because I neutered him at four months old. Because my vet told me that was what's best for the dog. Fuck you, asshole. No, it's not best for the dog. You're a piece of shit and you shouldn't be giving advice out like that. But that's how you make your money, asshole. The same way you sell your fucking science diet special formula for a fortune that's in your lobby. That's nothing but pure fucking garbage for these dogs. But you push that on people. So you keep your office full. Fuck you. How come you don't push a raw diet? Is everyone going to feed a raw diet? No. But why not tell them, hey, this is what's best. You should at least add some raw food if you're going to feed kibble, right? Right? So listen, I've been doing this stuff online for a long time. I've never, I've never tried to just algorithms and stuff. It's not me. You're going to see me go weeks without posting anything at times, especially on YouTube. But if there's something... I, I don't know if it's smart just to stay off of here or just to start talking about things constantly, but we have to do something that's better. And what do we have to change? The mass numbers of the everyday pet dog owner. But balanced dog trainers want to market and focus on each other and show off and impress each other. It's not helping the everyday dog owner. You understand? It's just not. I work with so many incredible people that I've never met in person that kick ass just by our phone calls and videos back and forth. And that's not me trying to sell something. I've never tried to sell shit. I try to avoid doing that because I said it really can't be done effectively. And people said, I want you to try. I want to pay you to help me through video. So finally I said, yeah, now some of those people are on here today that have completely kicked ass kicked ass, right? But I never once told someone, put an e-collar on your dog when he does that nail him. That's never come out of my mouth. You come to our seminars, whether it's with me, Jay, and Joel, or a solo seminar, how many times you see me put an e-collar on a dog and use it? Once? Seven years ago in Nebraska that people still bring up, right? When they focus on that, they should say, you know, this is like the only time he's ever done that. Even though I say on live, on a live video, this is something that I always say don't do, but I think in this, in right now, I think this is the best thing just to snap this dog out of where we need to get him to be. People still talk, bring that up when they're looking to someone to fucking something to, to pin on me. You understand? That's comical to me. That's got, now go over the other, you know, 5,000 videos that I put out where you see nothing like that, but they, they won't. You understand? Because they're trying to build their channels by sitting down and fucking talking dumb shit or they need something to talk about on their podcast and they can't talk about what they're doing. So they're going to talk about somebody else. Come on, man. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, 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 it's pure insanity, but this all got triggered. Like my private lesson with Keela today, it was so awesome. And I'm like, man, I love this stuff. There's, for me, there's nothing better than sitting down in someone's home and teaching as we go, just talking until I finally show them, right? But make no mind, make no mistake about it. When I left, I say, this isn't done. She's going to go back and make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. 
but now you understand how to deal with it and you have to be consistent. And if you're consistent, then it is going to go away permanently. You understand? That's important, guys. The human teaching aspect, it's there's people that I'm working with right now that have no chance of having success with their dog. And I'm not mean about it when I tell them, but they don't know how to make that connection with the dog. They're really, really awful, awful dog handlers. And I'm not saying that to be mean, but I'm not going to lie to them and try to, hey, just sign up for two more sessions. You know, just pay me this much and we'll get you. No, I won't do that. I won't do that. You know, um, there's some people that just, if they're going to have a dog, they should have something like Benny, like my Chihuahua, that's very easy to handle. And there's, you know, they're, they're not too big and strong for you. Right. Because there's some people that struggle. So it's so you could send me to carpentry school, right. For the next six months, I'm not going to be able to build you shit. Like I'm lacking that DNA. I'm the least handy guy you'll ever meet. Right. I had this, this, this real smart idea when I was going into my freshman year of high school I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to get away from my high school because I'm going to wind up just getting in trouble. I'm going to go to this vocational school a couple towns over and I'm going to learn a trade. So I went to Bergen Tech in Hackensack, New Jersey. And your freshman year, you spend a little time in each, you know, cur each uh, curriculum, whatever it is, each class to see what you like. So I thought I liked carpentry. I was in carpentry to make a long story short. I wasn't allowed to touch anything because everything I touched, things went really bad. I wasn't allowed to touch anything when I was in bakery class. Um, everyone liked me there because everyone baked for me and I ate everything that they made, but I wasn't allowed to touch anything. Mechanics class was the best. We had a really good mechanics program that was hard to get in there. Like it was a really good program. And one day, I'll never forget, my friend's name was Pat Riley. And I'll never forget it because Pat Riley, and I'm a lifelong Laker fan. Pat Riley had a, had the grease gun, the air compressed grease gun. And it started making this weird noise like, ah, ah, ah. and he was panicking. He's like, what do I do? What's it doing? I'm like, I'll help you. And I ran over there and I tried to help him. And next thing you know, this machine is screaming and there's grease shooting out everywhere, everywhere. And the instructor and all the guys that are working with him come running in and they hit that grease and they went flying. I was never allowed to leave the chair again, ever. I wasn't allowed, like my hands had to be on the desk. No bullshit. Okay. I work with people that are the same way with dogs and it's sad. I hate it. I hate it for them. I hate it, but they just don't have it. They don't, they can't keep their dog still. You understand what I'm saying? Like they can't just stand there and have their dog be still. They struggle that much. They can't take their dog for a walk. They can't make any kind of connection with it at all. The dog will never look at them unless they take out the European man purse, the big old fanny pack with the food in it. All these little signals they have to give the dog to, hey, pay attention to me. And then, oh, look, I got nice engagement. No, you don't. The dog just saw you load a big giant bag in front of your stomach with hot dogs. He doesn't give a fuck about you. He just wants the hot dogs. You understand? How often do people go out and train with their dogs with no rewards, with nothing? With nothing. Just feedback. Good job, buddy. That's what I like. Hey, good job. Nah, you got this wrong. How many times? Think about it. Train with nothing. You understand? Every board and train that's here, I use food to teach behaviors, right? But even in the middle of that, when dogs learn behaviors, I have sessions where there's nothing. It's just leash and collar. And I'm teaching everything the way I used to with my dogs. You can't just keep doing the same thing because you get a false positive when the dog's doing things for what you want, you know? And then we deal with the reactivity, like it's never ending, and people are redirecting with food and toys when, you know, both can have some value, but it's a lot more valuable when you're giving the dog good feedback and rewarding for making the right choices, not convincing the dog to look at you instead of the thing that's stressing them out. You understand? And people really struggle with that. So, 
for so long, nobody would use food, right? It was stupid. Then it became more important and we saw the value in it. And it is very, very powerful used in certain areas. But now it's become so overused and it's replaced the sincere relationship. And food has become such a punisher in so many people's hands and has completely punched the relationship between the dog and the human. And then you have the e-collars and the prong collars. You understand? If someone's telling you every time the dog does this, press the button, there's a problem. There's a problem. You're going to fail. You know, it. you're going to fail. You're going to fail. I can guarantee it. So like, how could a guy who wrote a book about e-collars, that's why I wrote the book about e-collars. Because if you do it the way I do, you're not going to have to use the e-collar. It's going to be so rare that you have to use that e-collar. I started a dog the other day, another wonderful lady, right? Big old lazy Doberman that doesn't get motivated for anything. Doesn't get motivated for anything. Like he's as slow as he's not going to make you look good. You understand what I'm saying? You know what happened when we started the e-collar training? We finally saw that dog come to life. And he had some pep in his step and he was enjoying himself. Why? Because that very basic, simple, negative reinforcement we started utilizing and pairing with positive re reinforcement became extremely rewarding to him. Very rewarding to him. You understand? And his owner was timid by using it. But again, he told her, you're going to mess this up. Like I made her work extensively before I let her go. Like she had to just keep making mistakes. And I told her, you're going to mess it up all week. But if we do it this way, you're not going to mess up the dog. That's the difference. That's what I've been trying to scream about since the beginning of time that I've been doing my first e-collar video in, I think, 2008, 2009. That's all I want to try to get across to people. If you do it like this, I didn't invent nothing. It's not my system, right? Then you could have the e-collar there just in case you need it and give your dog that freedom because dogs have to run off leash. Listen to me, Zach George, and the rest of you liars in the force-free community. Having your dog on a long line is not freedom. It's a life that sucks for a four-legged animal that is built and deserves to run at full speed and smell the wind and smell the trees and run through the woods. That's what a dog's supposed to fucking do. But you can't do that because you're against telling your dog no or the use of any tools. You're a liar. You lie to people and you cost dogs more lives than Parvo. And that's the truth. So I have no issue with force-free people that are legitimate in the way they perceive it. They just don't want to do it any other way. Be honest about it though, right? But the ones like the whack George, it's illegal what he does. It should be illegal what he does. You understand? Because he's making a fortune out of crippling people with their dogs. And that's disgusting. So there's a lot of good people out there, guys, that are willing to put in the work and try real hard. I know because I deal with them every day. There's a lot of good dog trainers out there, too, where their heart's in the right place. And um, do you ever see a dog's energy level plateau or even become lowered by using an e-collar? Not if it's done right, Kimberly. An e-collar should never suppress the drive in a dog, right? Should be no different. It should be no different, you know? If a dog all of a sudden, because of the e-collar on, won't chase a ball and normally does, won't bite a sleeve and normally does, won't chase a rabbit and normally does, right? Then we have a problem. Then we did something very wrong. It's not necessary. So there's good people out there, guys. There's really good dog trainers. I, I tend to speak of the trainers that show their dogs and show their work. It's To me, that's really impressive. I said it before. The first time I met Robert Cabral, real popular trainer, right? Um, 
Larry, please, if you can, look at my updated that I sent after our online lesson. Okay, Amir, I will. Um, first time I met Robert, I smiled from ear to ear when I walked in his home. You know why? His German Shepherd, his Belgian Malinois, and his two labs were at the door greeting me. He wasn't yelling at them to go get on their place. He didn't put them on tie backs. He didn't put them in down to just let them be dogs. That tells me everything I need to know right there, right? Even if we don't train the same, it's it's telling me everything right there. He's got good dogs. I go to Canada and, and you know, I meet my buddy Daniel here for the first time, Dan Croft Canine. He's got big, massive, scary looking savage dogs, incredible dogs, right? Dry for days, social, beautiful. That tells me who him and his boy are, him and Nathan are. They're legit. You know, I go see Haz out at Shield Canine. He's legitimate. He trains dogs and he shows it. Pet dogs and sport dogs, you know, Oscar Mora, always showing his training. Beautiful, beautiful work he does. I'm hanging with Oscar. I sat down and just watched him work his puppy and I was smiling from ear to ear. It's beautiful to me. That's beautiful to me. It's art when done right. But you guys are following people in the pet dog industry that you've never seen train a dog. You like their personalities and the entertainment they put out, but you never see them train a dog. Do you really want to learn? Started saying it a long time ago, guys. You got to start learning from some of the best sport dog people. I don't remember anyone saying that before me. I've said it for years. And so if you go back 11 years, 12 years, when I got Luca as a puppy, that's when I started focusing on that stuff, right? I showed so much stuff with Luca. He became the most amazing dog. Why? Because I took what I already knew about developing a really well-behaved dog inside the home. And he's extreme drive. Like, he's a, insane, right? And then I took what I first started learning when I first started going to Bart Ballone seminars. And I combined those two things. I didn't try to act like Bart or be Bart and say the things he says and all that shit that I see people doing. I took the information and I kept trying to make it own my own, just like he encourages people to do. And I created an amazing dog, an amazing dog. Like that bond between me and him, I'd send there in my yard at nine weeks old and just throw a mini wubba for him nonstop. And we played fetch and he'd bring it back to me and we'd play. We'd do a little training and I'd just keep throwing his toy and we'd play. That dog would literally run through fire for me. There's no doubt in my mind. No doubt in my mind. Nothing that dog can't do. Nothing he can't do. Right. He's crazy about me. I don't need food. I don't need a toy. I don't need anything. I can go out there right now after not training him for years and ask him to do all kinds of stuff. And he's going to give me everything. He's going to give me everything because that's my buddy. And he absolutely is crazy about me. You understand? So all you pet dog people, all you pet dog trainers, you're putting your focus in the wrong area. You know, it's not an easy thing to teach, but just try. Just it, it, it has to start feeling natural. There's a calmness and a silence about being with your dog when you're making that connection where you don't have to say anything. And when you get it, you're going to know. You will know. You'll feel it. Right. The same thing in the work, the feedback. Right. The dog does something. Everybody wants to scream and jump up and down and give them food. It's so artificial, so insincere. When really all the dog needs to feel great is nice job, buddy. Really nice job. It's all he needs. And he's going to be just gleaming. You understand? That's more sincere to him than jumping around, acting like a lunatic and shoving food in his face. All right? So... It's my last day as a bachelor. I drank so much bourbon the other night. I didn't plan to, but I had a buddy stop over and it got ugly. He almost made it to the couch, his whole body, just the, his top half of the body made it to the couch eventually. And we really tied a good one on. We really did. It was a really rough night. Drank a lot, a lot of bourbon, but I was in the gym the next morning, sweating it out, you know, but any questions, guys? If not, I'll let you homies go. I'm looking here. I tell my guys. 
Uh, yeah, but here's the thing, David, that love and affection, it's very rarely used properly. It's overused. And that affection becomes addicting for the human where it's constantly has to give affection to the dog. And then that affection becomes addicting to the dog and it always needs it where it should be handed out little here, little there until you're able. I'm a very affectionate person and I love on my dogs. Right. But you have to pay attention until you get your dogs where you want them, how you're doing those things. You understand? You understand, folks? You know, Noel, I felt great. I had a little bit of a headache in the morning. I won't even I won't even get into the full story on that night, right? It was it was rough. It was rough. Best part was my buddy's wife is in the driveway in the middle of the night. Let's go. I'm here. I'm taking you home. And he couldn't make it to the car. <laughs> it's freaking awesome. <laughs> my brother today is like, like, you're 52 years old and your friends aren't going to be able to hang out with you anymore. <laughs> it's like nothing has changed from when you were a kid. I'm like, I know. I know, man. I get it. I get it. You know, but just try to do better, guys, and learn. That's it. Learn from the animal, too, and learn from the people. Even the people that aren't dog trainers, everything you watch someone do is a teaching moment, whether it's good or bad. You understand? And the one thing I'll never do, I'll never, I won't ever give you bullshit on here. I'm not trying to build, I'm 52 years old and I don't need the money. Like I'm, I'm good. I, you know, when you're young, you think you want to make as much money as possible so you can buy all these nice, I don't give a shit anymore. I can live on very little, right? I just want to sit on my recliner and watch TV with my wife and have a glass of wine at night. That's what makes me happy these days. These hang with my kids. That's it. So I'm in a position and I've always been in a position where I never had to do this to make a living. But when you're dealing with someone that has to pay rent, has to pay employees, have to pay bills, just pay attention to everything they're doing. You know, don't just go to their website. Oh, he's got a nice website. This is good. Ask my buddy Brad on here who just was an online client. He was getting a puppy recently and I didn't try to shatter his hopes, but I didn't make it easy for him. No, you have to do well yeah she said all the right things and have well here's the thing i told him brad brad you could respond i said brad anybody i've ever talked to that got a shitty puppy all started with someone with a nice website and said all the right things do your homework meet the mom the dad get a list of clients who have dogs like go deep be a motherfucker be a pain in the ass and really research what you're getting because you're going to be stuck with this dog for a long time and he did he did. Now he's got an awesome little puppy. You know what I mean? But I don't make it easy on people. I just I don't tell people what they want to hear. I tell people what they need to hear if I have the answer. You understand? Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Dylan, you, you, it's, uh, you get it right. You get it. Uh, everything's on my website, Nadine. It's current. It's it's working right now, but I'm still adding more and, and, um, and updating things on there. You know, but and this here he is. Brad just commented he, he was a he was a phone consultation guy who was really struggling with this dog. I never met him. And his dog went from can't be around dogs and won't do anything outside to now he goes on off leash walks and his bulldog plays with dogs. He did that. He did that. He's not a dog trainer. He did that. Because every time he sent me a video, I was like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? No, we got to change this. This makes no sense to the dog. He's like, oh, okay. And each video got a little better and he got a little better. Now his dog's amazing because he did that, right? He did that. And I'll say it again. How many trainers are showing clients dogs a year down the road, two years down the road, five years down the road? Not a lot. Not a lot. I'll show you that. I will show you that. And it's not because of what I've done with the dog. It's what I've done with the human. And that's where the real reward is. The true everlasting lifetime result comes from there. Comes from there. Okay. Okay, folks. Um, I'm going to go have my second pint of haagen -Dazs. I got cherry vanilla and vanilla bean, which are my two go-tos. But today I tried vanilla chocolate chip. That's what I started with. And it was outstanding. So I'm going to eat a lot of ice cream. And um, being that I'm extremely lactose intolerant, if you need me, call me. I will be on the toilet. Okay? 
Thanks for all the support as always, guys. Peace.